Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Pollinator Week virtual presentation series. This is a series that's sponsored by NIPSCO, a NYSource company, via their NYSource Charitable Foundation. Uh, we received an environmental action grant this spring and we're thrilled that we had the opportunity to not only engage our partners and programming throughout the week, but also showcase all of the work they're putting into our pollinator garden landscaping guide just being completed right, right now. Um, while they're also working on these conservation projects together. So this has been a thrilling week for us and we're, we are on day five, our last day um, of the programming. Um, throughout the week, I'm, I'm going to share my screen um, to provide just a quick recap of what we have um, accomplished this, this past week. And you can revisit our presentations on the Facebook page. They are being recorded and will be posted on our website at a future date. And we've covered a lot of ground. Um, we started out on Monday by showcasing our brand new Living in the Dunes Guide, Volume 2. Um, and we've been bringing that guide to life each and every day with presentations from our committee members that help put the guide together. So on Tuesday, we learned from Carl Ackerman and Eric Bird how to develop pollinator habitat in our home gardens. And this connects to the template garden designs that are featured in the guide. On Wednesday, we learned about native bee research at the Indiana Dunes National Park, and also learned about the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and the moths from um, Steve Sass and Amanda Smith and, and Desi covered the native bee research on Wednesday. We were so thankful for that and it connects directly to the guide. We feature seven groups of pollinators in the guide. Um, yesterday we had a really special opportunity to connect with Susan Kurt, uh, Joelle Perez, and Barb Labus to learn about the magic behind pollinator art, photography, and culture. So Susan showed us what it takes to, um, you know, execute her craft of taking pictures while out in nature. Um, Joelle talked about the deep cultural connections that the monarch has to communities in Mexico and East Chicago and across North America. Um, and Barb gave us an inside perspective on what goes into creating her masterful uh, pollinator illustrations. There's four of those in the guide. Um, and it, boy, I was so overwhelmed with joy yesterday. That was such a gift. But you know, today is also incredibly special. This pollinator garden landscaping guide is designed to provide the homeowner, you, with the conservation tools that you need to protect our precious pollinators. Learn about the plants that will support them from early spring through late fall. Um, help you understand which ecosystems are uh, occur in the region and what might align most to your type of landscape, where your house is positioned and your solar expo exposure, your soil, etc. All of this um, effort is something that strengthens the work of conservation partners that are setting out to achieve really high level goals. They're, they're trying to achieve landscape scale pollinator habitat conservation. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And before I, um, I launch into um, the content that we have to showcase this incredible work, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more um, about how you can stay connected with us on Facebook or on our website to sign up for the, for the guide. Um, but also, you know, connect with Save the Dunes by um, our e-newsletter. Um, check out our partners and their websites. Learn more about each of their organizations. Um, all of us are going to be communicating opportunities for you to continue to be involved or learn more. Um, and so, so that is, um, that's definitely a resource we wanted to share. Um, so Katie, Desi, Steve, and Eric, I know you're all on the screen and I'll provide a, a, an introduction to each of you following a video that Katie has put together to showcase landscape scale pollinator conservation work um, that partners are engaged in. Hi, I'm Katie Hobgood from Save the Dunes, and I'm excited to share one of the projects we've been working on to improve pollinator habitat across the Northwest Indiana region. 
This project was made possible through a grant from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, or GLRI, and the purpose of the project is to connect high quality natural areas by improving marginal lands that can serve as corridors for pollinators. Save the Dunes not only is improving pollinator habitat at one of our properties in Hobart, but we are also managing all the different partners that are involved in this project. One of my favorite parts about this project is how highly collaborative it is. We have partners from federal agencies, um, nonprofits, land trusts, utility companies, um, city and county parks departments, universities, schools, even private landowners. It's a great example of how working together can really make a difference. So now we will hear from some of our partners on this project, including the Indiana Dunes National Park, Shirley Hines Land Trust, and NIPSCO, to learn about the work that they've been doing and why it's so important for pollinators in Northwest Indiana. Hi, I'm Desi Robertson. I'm the research coordinator for the Great Lakes Research and Education Center based at Indiana Dunes National Park. And I'm also coordinating a lot of the pollinator projects that we're involved with. The Indiana Dunes National Park has been working to restore habitat for our native pollinators. And we're really excited to work with our partners to continue this, these efforts outside of the park. Pollinators, of course, don't know um, park boundaries, and so any work that can happen um, to improve their habitat outside of the park ultimately improves habitat for all the pollinators in the region. So we're at Miller Woods, and where you can see we have some really nice pollinator habitat. This is what we consider high-quality habitat. A lot of the work that we're doing with our partners um, as part of this GLRI um, restoration project is to improve the quality in the areas that um, are adjacent to the park or might be providing corridors to connect high quality areas of the park to high quality areas such as this. So some of these corridors of course um, involve um, our conservation trusts that we're working with like Save the Dunes and Shirley Hines um, and also our rights away so working with partners like NIPSCO. Hi my name is Eric Bird. I'm the stewardship director for Shirley Hines Land Trust. So we're out here in Griner Nature Preserve. It's in the heart of the Hobart Nature District. With the GLRI funding through the National Park Service and help with Save the Dunes, um, we're able to do a lot more restoration to form more pollinator habitat and manage more specifically for pollinators. So things like removing invasive species and, and removing some invasive brush that sort of opens up prairie-like habitat to allow flowers like this to grow um, and be more proliferate out here but also things like leaving small brush piles and leaving some open soil areas and things like that. And we're working really hard to do restoration and provide a lot of connectivity for these pollinators to have places to nectar and hibernate and reproduce. So we're very happy to work with our partners on these things and we're getting a lot of acres restored with that GLRI funding. So this area has a lot of protected land and it, it's in a very urban area. So some of our nature preserves are a little bit separated from the others. It's very important to provide more pollinator habitat for connectivity between these uh, nature preserves and allow the smaller things like insects and butterflies uh, to, to be able to move around and have places to nectar, to hibernate, to make make their homes and reproduce. And we've worked a lot with the NIPSCO uh, power utility company that has power lines that run through this area to do restoration and do native plantings that also provide a lot of connectivity between us and then places a little bit north of the Deep River area. This idea of habitat connectivity is so important for our pollinators. We have many wonderful natural areas in Northwest Indiana, be it the Indiana Dunes National Park, State Park, one of Shirley Hines Land Trust's nature preserves, or any of our other protected lands. But in between these high quality habitats, there are homes and development and industry, and this makes traveling from one oasis to the next rather treacherous for our pollinators. Being able to partner with a utility company like NIPSCO who has these long stretches of land known as rights of way, creates the perfect corridor, a pollinator highway, if you will, and improves connectivity across the Northwest Indiana landscape tremendously. Hello, I'm Steve Barker, uh, NIPSCO Environmental. We're on the Calumet Trail right of way today. It's um, actually 
owned in fee by NIPSCO, roughly 10 miles long and well over 300 acres in size. And then there's over 400 acres of native plant species. Uh, we're standing right now, we actually have a license agreement with the National Park Service to do management along for public access on the trail and then ecological management on the right of way itself. So NIPSCO largely operates in Northwest Indiana where it has several hundred miles of NIPSCO fee-owned right of way and several thousand acres of right of way in natural area status. And I would like to bring that up only because it provides critical habitat connectivity uh, across the landscape. So when we're trying to protect managed lands, like the Indiana News National Park, is looking at it from a habitat connectivity standpoint and how we can provide compatible vegetation with the, with the National Park and other managed lands. So in 2017, NIPSCO restored roughly 20 acres of sand prairie on the Calumet Trail as a part of a construction project. And, and since then, we've been managing it to better promote pollinator habitat and biodiversity. So this is an area where, in partnership with the Park Service and Save the Dunes through the GLRI project, we were able to do spot herbicide application of, of invasive species and then look at how we can better manage and restore areas adjacent to the restored area. So um, this area right here off to our right, we employed conservation mowing, herbicide treatment, and then native, native seed introductions. Why is NIPSCO undertaking pollinator habitat restoration? A NYSORS parent company of NIPSCO recently issued a biodiversity statement promoting pollinator habitat and conservation of managed lands. Uh, so really we're trying to promote and enhance ecological integrity across various rights of way under the, the NYSORS footprint. Uh, we always try to find those win-win situations. So in this case, our primary responsibility is providing safe and reliable energy to our customers um, while also balancing it with environmental needs. So in this case, if you look around, we have gas and electric transmission facilities here. So looking at native pollinators, that is a suitable uh, and compatible vegetation to deliver that safe and reliable energy to our customers. So there we get the win-win benefit of energy delivery and then biodiversity on top of that. Having companies like NIPSCO as a partner on this project, with their commitment to sustainability and biodiversity, it really takes habitat connectivity to the next level. And it enhances all of the incredible work that our other project partners are achieving through this grant. In just the first two years of this five-year project, hundreds of acres of pollinator habitat have been improved or restored across Northwest Indiana. We're stronger and more impactful when we work together. And now we'd like to invite you to join us in this very important work. Sometimes we think that the National Park, the State Park, the Land Trust, they've got that pollinator conservation work handled, right? But in reality, there's a lot that we could all be doing to help pollinators thrive in Northwest Indiana. In addition to the habitat work that we are doing and our partners are doing, um, you can also be a part of helping to conserve pollinators by providing habitat in your own backyard. So you essentially could plant a little mini national park in your own backyard by providing um, native plants that could be um, nectar resources or host plants that could be um, um, food for caterpillars, for butterflies and moths. And the great thing about doing that is um, not only are you helping pollinators, but you can also enjoy um, observing them in your own backyard. To learn about the different pollinators who call Northwest Indiana home and the plants that you can put in your home garden to attract and support them, be sure to sign up to receive your copy of our brand new Pollinator Garden Landscaping Guide by visiting our website savedunes.org. Thank you to all of our fellow collaborators on this project for doing incredible work to improve pollinator habitat across our region. And we are forever grateful to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative for providing funding to make this work possible. Wow! I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, Every time I hear about this work, I, I'm just moved. I'm absolutely blown away. Um, and I'm also thrilled that Save the Dunes has such an asset like Katie Hobgood on staff to create and edit these marvelous videos of all of us. Thank you, Katie, um, not just for the video 
um, from today, but also from, um, you know, during the week. I am going to invite these wonderful partners um, joining us this evening to the stage to talk more about their Great Lakes Restoration Initiative project. Um, first, I've got a couple of bios to read. Um, and, and then we'll ask them about their roles. And I'm gonna start with our very own Katie Hopgood. Katie is the program director at Save the Dunes. She is a Northwest Indiana native with 11 years of nonprofit management experience. She is incredibly creative and an inquisitive individual with a proficiency in process creation and implementation and a strong background in community collaboration and engagement. In her free time, Katie serves as the board president for the East Chicago Education Foundation. She also spends time volunteering with Humane Indiana Wildlife, where she works with the education ambassador owl, owl species and fosters baby squirrels. Katie enjoys traveling, hiking, and expanding her knowledge base whenever she can. Katie, um, what um, would you like to share about your role and perspective of this GLRI project? Um, well, thank you for that introduction, Victoria. Um, my role in this project, it's, it's kind of a, a threefold responsibility. So um, first, Save the Dunes owns a property in Hobart with about 20 acres of prairie habitat. So we're managing that property to improve pollinator habitat on site. Um, but I think one of my, my larger roles is um, administering the grant. So I handle all the paperwork and reports and invoices. Um, Desi and I have spent many an afternoon filling out amendment cooperative agreements, SF424s, <laughs> very fun stuff. Um, and then my final role, uh, which we'll be ramping up more this year, is coordinating outreach opportunities with the community so that we can share what we're doing, uh, why it's important, and how everyone can help expand upon our work in their home gardens. Thank you, Katie. Next, we have Desi Robertson. Um, Desi is an entomologist, and um, as you've heard this week, if you tuned into her fabulous Bee Talk on Wednesday, she currently serves as the research coordinator for the Great Lakes Research and Education Center based at the Indiana Dunes National Park. Desi is the National Park Service lead for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Pollinator Task Force. That is a big hat to wear. And she coordinates the research projects at national parks throughout the Great Lakes region. So we're really honored to have Desi on deck tonight to talk more about um, the GLRI grant and pollinator conservation in the region. Her projects focus on understanding how best to conserve pollinators, especially native bees, how restoration efforts can um, best benefit pollinators, so best conserve and benefit, and how pollinator communities have changed over time. So if you if you didn't tune in on Wednesday to hear her bee talk, please do um, you know scroll back through our Facebook feed and um, and take a look. They've got some incredible research going on in the park right now. So Desi, I wanted to invite you to share um, your role and, and any perspective um, that you, you wanted to offer on the GLRI grant. Thank, thank you, Victoria, for that um, very kind introduction. Um, well, so, you know, this project was born a few years ago now, and um, it, it was sort of the collision of a lot of different things, you know, kind of this, one of those things where the stars really aligned. and. Um, I've been very interested in pollinators as an entomologist, of course, so that, that I had a personal interest in, in doing pollinator work. Um, and there was a history of, of some great scientific research involved um, at, you know, at the Indiana Dunes, uh, some foundational research that was um, done by our USGS colleagues. And um, at the time, I was also um, an NPS representative to um, a working group for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative called the um, Landscape Connectivity Working Group, which was a um, sort of a pilot pilot group of um, of a, another working group, the Habitats Group. And one of the things that you know we were we recognized in that working group was the importance of habitat connectivity. And so. Um, 
you know, looking at talking to um, our and my NPS colleagues at the park, and um, and then talking with with you all with with our great partners, you know, we realized that we really had this incredible opportunity here to um, to kind of focus our efforts on pollinators as a landscape connectivity conservation project. And so um, that's that's kind of how this project got off the ground. And and there's a lot of different components to it. So there. Of course, the, the great partnerships that we have going on here, um, we have on the ground habitat restoration work going on inside um, the park as well. And, and then there's also some science, some research components to this. But um, the, the neat thing about this project is, uh, as you mentioned, so I'm, uh, we have a new Great Lakes Restoration um, initiative pollinator task force. And I say it's new, I think we've had it for a couple of years now. <laughs> it still feels new, um, although we've accomplished so much. And, and this task force is represented by um, various agencies. We, we have Fish and Wildlife, um, US Forest Service, um, USDA, uh, NRCS, um, USGS, and of course the, the National Park Service. And, um, and you know, our goals are, conservation and, and we're focusing on native bees as, as our key pollinator group, um, conservation uh, across the entire Great Lakes Basin. And I really think that this project serves um, as a model or can serve as a model for a lot of other um, landscape uh, connectivity, la landscape scale conservation um, projects ac across the region. And with, especially with the partnerships between federal agencies, private land trusts, um, and of course our rights away. So I'm um, just really, really excited to be a part of this project. And we're excited that you are here in Northwest Indiana where we all benefit from your knowledge, expertise and partnership, Desi, thank you. Um, next, I am going to introduce Eric Bird. Um, Eric also presented for us earlier this week with a wonderful presentation. If you, if you missed it, go back and scroll through our Facebook feed and check it out. Eric is a stewardship director for Shirley Hines Land Trust. He manages the stewardship program, staff, program and staff and all of their nature preserves across the region. Imagine that, he's incredible. Um, Eric has been with the organization for approximately six years. He has over 10 years of experience in ecological stewardship and restoration and holds a master's in biological sciences from Purdue. He also holds a minor in environmental sciences and an AS in interdisciplinary agricultural studies. And I bet you if you catch him at one of the nature preserves and ask him about the new work that they're doing to convert agricultural land into natural areas, he'll probably share some really incredible information with you. I've got a little bit of an inside scoop on that. So it's very exciting work. Eric has substantial experience with ecological restoration of natural areas and also native gardening in his own wild backyard. So Eric, thank you for, um, for being on deck with us again tonight. I'd like to invite you to talk about your role in the GLRI project and any perspective that you'd like to share. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Shirley Hines Land Trust owns and manages uh, quite a few nature preserves in the um, Hobart Nature District. And that's one of the areas that this project has focused on. So there's a lot of um, different partners in that area uh, managing uh, na natural lands. So like for example, DNR and the National Park Service and Save the Dunes and Shirley Hines and NIPSCO, we're all there. And then there's a lot of other ones, uh, Isaac Walton and Woodland Savannah. Um, and of course, like the city parks department and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, partners working together to manage habitat and preserve lands. Um, and a lot of that over the years has focused on connectivity, right? We're all sort of helping each other help this area grow out bigger. It's a very unique area. Um, the Hobart Nature District is actually a, a project where the city has zoned it as a nature district, which is quite unique and um, exemplary, you know, that a lot of other cities could do that sort of thing to open green space in their city and preserve those lands. Um, so my role on this project as stewardship director, uh, Shirley Hines does have a pretty significant stewardship staff that does a lot of restoration, 
done a lot of work in Hobart with these partners, a lot of conservation action planning, a lot of um, invasive species prioritization. So my staff goes out and manages the lands um, and, and we've just been doing some of the restoration work there. So uh, some of the areas are very, very high quality. They're state dedicated nature preserves. They have um, an enormous amount of diversity. Other areas were past restoration projects or smaller parcels that um, need a little love. Um, you know, we're, we're not always restoring everything all the time. So this Great Lakes Restoration Initiative project allows us to do more work on those properties that are sort of marginal and in between um, that are sort of connecting some of these pieces. So it not only forms greater connection, but um, expands the amount of area that's open to pollinators. Uh, removing invasive species helps improve resiliency to those natural areas and improve habitat for the pollinators, um, also improving climate resiliency. And then there's quite a few corridors in the Hobart area. The, the Nice Horse Nipsco corridor that runs north and south is completely significant in connecting that Hobart Nature District area to um, Deep River Park to the south and um, some of the county parks to the north and, and all the way just up to the national park system up by the lake. So that's very expansive. And then there's a few railroad corridors and of course, Deep River, a lot of river corridors form a lot of great connectivity and provide some natural area as well for long expanses to, to connect some of these um, more disjunct parcels that are sort of isolated otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. That was really um, helpful uh, to to hear. I started to piece together in my mind. You have, you know, like for example, uh, you know, the black soil prairie that Susan Kurt and I went to. That's owned and managed by Shirley Hands Land, Land Trust. That's a really high quality nature preserve. And so some of the other nature preserves, as you say, need a little bit of love. You're able to address invasive species problems and um, you know, support the pollinator plants and, and pollinators through projects like like this. Is, is and this one? is another um, sort of great thing about Hobart. You sort of mentioned that prairie. Um, I, I try to uh, hammer this home sometimes when I'm given presentations or hikes. Um, the landscape diversity breeds some actual diversity in the plants. Um, which breeds actual diversity in pollinators and the wildlife and all those sorts of things. So um, when you're in the Indiana Dunes National Park, there's a lot of diversity. Um, there's a diverse landscape, right? There's a lot of different dunes formations that we're familiar with, dune swale and black oak savanna and four dunes and all these kinds of coastal wetlands. Um, in Hobart, it's, it's unique in that so same sort of way, but very different. So there's prairies, there's uh, burr oak savannas, which is a unique savanna type. Um, there's deep river runs through there. So there's riparian corridors. Um, there's woodlands, there's wetlands, there's fens. Um, so all of that, that diversity uh, makes for a great amount of, of different habitats, different microclimates, different um, niches that all of these pollinators can fill. So it's a, it's a really great place to do this because I think that you're uh, capturing a huge amount of diverse pollinators that need very different um, specifications, right? Different host plants and different habitats all in one big area. So it's really amazing. It, it really is amazing. Um, and, you know, I, I recognize that without the um, partnership of NIPSCO and these right of ways, a huge piece would be missing but it's not. And tonight we couldn't be um, uh, more honored to welcome Steve Barker um, to the conversation. Um, he's very well known across the region with our conservation partners, he's an asset to the region. He has more than 20 years of professional experience in environmental permitting and compliance, ecological and prescribed fire management and conservation planning. He currently serves as environmental principal for NIPSCO, supporting various environmental functions for the company. He is also leading efforts for the NYSOR's candidate conservation agreement with assurances for the monarch butterfly, which for those of you that don't know has to do with whether or not that butterfly gets listed as endangered 
um, NIPSCO is working with organizations to make sure that they're going to do everything that they can, no matter what. Um, he's also supporting biodiversity initiatives, um, NYSource's sustainability commitments through that biodiversity lens and conservation efforts throughout North, Northern Indiana. So Steve, thank you for joining us this evening for your partnership and um, wanted to invite you to share a little bit more about your role in the GLRI project and any other perspectives you'd, you'd like to offer. Great, thanks, Victoria. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank the National Park Service for this opportunity to partner um, you know, with the, you know, via the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And then with Save the Dunes, of course, too, offering leadership on this project. And then hats off to Shirley Hines Land Trust uh, for the years of conservation work, land management work, you know, across Northwest Indiana. So, um, you know, my role is basically serving as the project lead and project manager for NIPSCO. We had a preferred vendor that specializes in natural resource management. So I was able to work with that vendor to do more targeted pollinator habitat restoration on the NIPSCO rights of way. And so this was a unique opportunity where as before, you know, we were tasked with safety reliability type issues. And this afforded us the opportunity to really target pollinator habitat restoration in some areas that, that really needed it. Um, as we mentioned on the video, the Calumet Trail was one of our priority areas. It's been there for, for, for quite a while. It dates back to the early 1930s. Um, and then it, it really has high quality remnant native plant communities on it. But like other areas, you know, there's stressors in there, invasive species, things like that. So we really targeted those areas. You know, we, we used a number of techniques to kind of really promote pollinator habitat. Um, and so that was, again, you know, without this grant, we couldn't really fine tune those method, methods and means. And so this is, this will help us kind of implement other projects across the, the nice source territory. Um, and then for me in particular, really prioritizing you know, where we do management to support pollinator habitat in Northwest Indiana. Um, and so I'll, I'll go back to this one. We, we prioritized uh, areas that had direct nexus to, to the national park. Eric mentioned Holbert, that's on the list as well, where we're gonna be, we have a draft management plan in there. And then once we get the funding to support it, we'll be going in there to tr really try to address habitat needs along that corridor as well. So again, um, hats off to the team, glad to be here. and. Uh, look forward to on future collaborative efforts. Thank you, Steve. Um, well, now that we've introduced all of our panelists, we're going to transition into a Q&A session for the remainder of our time together. We have several questions prepared um, to sort of bring out more of the, the, the details of the project and, and different perspectives. And the first question that we have, and this is for everybody, uh, but Steve, since we just heard from you, I'm gonna ask you to um, provide your thoughts first. Um, um, what has been the impact of this project so far? Uh, what, what do you, um, and I, I address that to you first, Steve, is in that um, wonderful video, we saw that uh, time lapse picture of like year one, year two, year three, and by year three, um, you know, I didn't know I wasn't looking at uh, a high quality prairie. Yeah. So I'm yeah. curious. Well, you know, this this project really supports a number of different projects, but some of those photos you saw the before and after, th those were executed, and those were part of construction projects. So really post-construction is where I come in too, making sure that we're designing seed mixes, seeds in the right place, plants in the right place. So once we're done with that construction project, we can return it to pre-construction conditions, if not better conditions. And I've seen that if you, you design a project well, throw in, throw in some short-term, long-term uh, O&M on it, that you can really improve a lot of the biodiversity, plant diversity that's out there. Um, and so it's been, it's been great. I, I mean, again, like, you know, through this collaboration, you know, I can lean on Shirley Hines, Save the Dunes National Park Service for their expertise in this field as well, and then just continue to move that forward then. That's wonderful. And so part of the impact of the project is fine tuning the techniques that work and collaborating with the partners and achieving these really high quality pollinator habitats. Yeah, especially if you're working on that that conservation level or that regional level, or you know, like with Indiana Dunes Ecosystem Alliance, um, that really saved the dunes started. 
we can look at that scale and then how we can target and prioritize where my NIPSCO hat, where we target and prioritize habitat management. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so for the viewers at home that might be familiar with, you know, the layout of the state park and the national park sort of hugging the shoreline, and then they'll be familiar with the South Shore train line that runs there um, just directly north of um, Dunes Highway, Route 12. The, there's a NIPSCO right-of-way right behind that that's connecting, that's connecting a lot of the pieces of, of the park. And so that's one, one part of the landscape scale. But then as Eric was talking about um, some of the impact that they're seeing at Charlie Hines is down in Hobart. And so folks may not be as familiar that there is national park property down in Hobart and actually an entire cons conservation district being proposed down there. Um, and so, Eric, I, I wanted to invite you back uh, to share a little bit more about um, what you think the impact has been so far, or like um, what would be the, um, the absolute ideal outcome um, for this project or just in terms of conservation. Yeah, so I think that um, in, in Hobart in particular, uh, a lot of us partners here and a lot more partners have worked for a number of years um, to first of all preserve land right as a land trust that's what Shirley Hines land trust does is purchasing or putting conservation easements on land to make sure that um, it's preserved forever just like a national park or a state park um, so that it's sort of there for all of us right for nature and for people um, and we've all put a lot of time and energy in sort of a landscape scale uh, conservation planning. So all of us partners being there um, really helps do a lot more than any one partner could do by themselves, right? Um, if, if everybody wasn't there, it wouldn't be so much landscape scale. It'd just be, you know, Shirley Hines managing their properties in Hobart. Um, that there is so much partners and so many people care about that and the collaboration um, and especially with the city. I mean, such a big deal to make it a nature district and to say, OK, we're going to, you know, treat this place differently and have different, um, you know, ordinances and zoning laws there so that all of us partners can um, implement our management very well. So it's sort of uh, at this point was like a perfect storm for a, a project like this because we've looked into it so far. We've done so much planning, um, a lot of prioritization about what gets preserved and what gets acquired to connect those pieces up. Um, and coming in at just a perfect time. So we at Shirley Hines were finishing some Sustain Our Great Lakes projects. Uh, the uh, Indiana DNR Department of Natural Resources and Division of Nature Preserves was um, finishing up some work with the U.S. Army Corps and the um, uh, Low Calumet River Drainage Basin Commission. I'm hoping I get that right. They, there's a lot of words in their title. Um, but we're um, taking care of some mitigation projects there. So a lot of properties getting restored, forming a lot greater acreage and connectivity. There's well over a thousand acres of protected lands just in that nature district. Um, so a lot of work was being done, but it was sort of being done uh, either restoring areas that weren't habitat before, right? Converting uh, fallow fields or agricultural fields to prairies and savannas, um, or in the case of Shirley Hines, trying to work really hard on sort of our gems like Crestmore Prairie and like Gordon and Faith Griner Nature Preserve, the ones that people are familiar with and can visit. But like I said, there's these smaller um, areas that don't get as much attention or funding or love. And it, it, it's hard to manage restoration projects on some of those smaller areas until there is greater connectivity. So it was sort of happening at a, at a good time. Um, I think for me, we're seeing some of those places uh, respond a little bit better. For example, um, you guys have the Petticord property. And um, I think the first year I went to see it was to, to go look at it and see if we couldn't help like do some 
um, maintenance and management on it, but it didn't really need it because it was looking so beautiful. You did such a good job seeding that like things were coming in and the cover crop was working. Um, so I think enhancing those areas and expanding those areas is really important because if any, for restoration funding, if we're putting it all into just one isolated island out there, it's really difficult to maintain that high quality um, nature of it all, right? It's difficult to keep the invasive species out of there. It's difficult to keep it from not being encroached and developed all around or the hydrology, hydrology to be changed. But once you sort of have a bigger landscape scale, it's a, it's a better investment. It's sort of an economy of scale that the work that we put into these places can be maintained for a longer time and can have a greater impact. So acre for acre, you're having um, so much more impact for the long run, right? And all of us are in this, this game of forever. When we preserve these places, it's not like, oh, we're preserving them for 50 years or as long as Eric's with Shirley Hines or something like that. It will go on beyond me and beyond the next generation and my children's children will be able to go to these places. So it's really meaningful that uh, it's impactful, very impactful, very sustainable and, um, you know, will be meaningful even in the future and still there for us all. It's absolutely tremendous. I had chills when you were like, it's not just for me, it, you know, it's for my grandchildren. Um, that's, that's just tremendous. Um, Desi, do you have any thoughts on the impact of the project so far or, you know, perspective that you might offer as the lead for the pollinator task force or, you know, what the goals and priorities are for the interagency um, collaboration and partnership there? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, as I had mentioned before, I, a lot of the other agencies, I really are seeing this, I think, as um, a potential model to replicate in other areas across the basin. And with the, with the task force, when we started discussing, you know, where we're going to put all of our efforts, because, you know, the basin's a huge area, right? And, and um, we want to restore as much of it as possible. We want to create as much habitat as possible, but but we're limited in our capacity and funding, and and so we want to be strategic about about where we we um, put habitat on the ground. And so um, one of the things you know we had, because we were federal agencies, we we looked to first you know our own public lands, our own lands that we ourselves were managed. That was sort of like an easy thing to check off. But um, when we started thinking about you know, landscape, it, the next big step, you know, there were some um, great, as, you know, Eric and, and Steve, you know, described there, there are already these great, great um, other uh, initiatives going on apart from, pub, you know, our public lands. And, and so why, why do we not want to, you know, work together? <laughs> and, and so by strategically kind of looking at those adjacent lands and, and again, you know, it's, it's, I, I want to emphasize, it's not that, you know, the, the GLRI or our pollinator task force, we didn't have this great big idea. Um, a lot of these things were already happening um, through the ideas group, through, through the Indiana Dunes um, Ecosystem Alliance. I mean, this, this, you guys were already thinking strategically, thinking um, about landscape scale conservation. And so it was really just a, a no brainer to, um, to extend that, you know, through with GLRI and to really um, try to coordinate these efforts uh, uh, just a little bit more. So um, yeah, so it's, uh, I hope to see more of these um, similar projects throughout the basin with other agencies and even with uh, other national parks as well. Thank you, Desi. And, and just in case our viewers aren't familiar with the terminology, when you, ref when you say basin, what are you referring to? Um, no, it's a, a great point, uh, and I apologize if I sometimes uh, talk like a government bureaucrat <laughs> and with all my acronyms and, and whatnot. Um, but so the basin uh, refers to the Great Lakes Basin. So so all the, it's the drainage system for the Great Lakes and Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding um, funds projects within the basin. And so for the folks here in Northwest Indiana, that's not just Lake Michigan. That's right. 
So, so things like the East Branch, the Little Calumet, Calumet, all those things um, drain into the basin. So we we can look at uh, you know Lake County, Porter County, Laporte County, and you can can kind of draw a little line. In, um, part of a, a vast majority of those counties drain into uh, Lake Michigan, but in the southern end, southern end, it, it drains the other direction. It drains into the Kankakee, right, and and out and that goes out through the Mississippi and in, into the Gulf Coast. So we've got a little mini continental divide right in our own region here. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Desi. Uh, very, it's so interesting to think about all of the um, government agencies working together seamlessly, and, and that you're the lead. Um, I'm so proud to have the lead in, in Northwest Indiana. That's wonderful. It's just convenience. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I would like to turn it over to Katie to talk about um, the impact that she has seen in the project so far. Um, and maybe if you, if you would offer a lens of um, how projects like this help to sustain part, the partnerships or any insider perspective you can share about, um, you know, the the impact and outcome of, of these collab the collaborative and the collaborative nature of the projects um, from from your perspective. Sure, thanks. Um, so the the impact I think I would echo what everyone's already said that on the ground restoration work has been incredible, um, but something that I have have really enjoyed is as you mentioned that the impact on our partnerships that I think that we've um, really solidified as a, a collaborative group and it's kind of bleeding into other projects as well. So, you know, outside of the GLRI grant, we're trying to work more collaborative, collaboratively because we see that it works here. And so, well, what can we try here or over here, or maybe with this grant or this funding source? Um, so I, I think that it's catching on. <laughs> I hope that it is. Um, and we can continue to achieve these bigger and brighter goals. We're in, um, we have three years left on this grant. So, you know, we're just getting started. <laughs> so uh, we've done a lot of great work, but we have a lot more to do. So it's, it's really exciting. That is exciting. And thank you, Katie. Um, and, you know, with that in mind, if you've got three more years on this grant, um, do you think pollinators will be protected in three years? Will the job be done in three years? Um, Desi, I wanted to just pose to you and, and, and the other panelists, please, please chip in. Um, what are the challenges facing biodiversity in the region and, and how does fragmentation play into that? Well, um, you know, pollinators are really in decline all around the world and that includes our region. Many people are familiar with the monarch butterfly, for instance, and uh, Victoria, I always love quoting your um, gateway bug to the world of pollinators, and, and that's oftentimes uh, the general public's sort of first um, ex experience with, with pollinators, and they're very familiar and ubiquitous. And, and, but even this really, really common butterfly that we all grew up with and, and are so, you know, so part of so many of our, our, our childhoods and our lives, it's in decline. Um, you, it, locally, we lost the Carner Blue Butterfly in um, the Indiana Dunes region, which is just heartbreaking. Uh, you've heard about the federally endangered rusty patch bundle, bumblebee, which was listed just a couple years ago. Um, this is a bumble, bumblebee that was very common throughout much of the Eastern United States, including parts of Indiana. Um, and I, it, we don't have records of it in the Indiana Dunes region. Our, our, closest record is around St. John's area. But, um, but in Indiana, this, this uh, species hasn't been seen for almost 20 years now. Um, so, you know, it, it's while these sort of more charismatic species are, are um, getting a lot of attention, uh, a lot of the other species are also in trouble. And they're the species that no one really thinks of, the, the really tiny little bees. Um, you know, there's over 200 species of bees at, in the Indiana Dunes region. And, and I'm not, and you know, the honeybee is just one species and it's not even a native species. So, you know, when we're talking about pollinator conservation and, um, you know, we're talking about butterflies and moths, but we're also talking about those hundreds of native bee species. And, and those are on decline. We don't have a whole lot of information. Um, 
in Illinois, there was a hundred year study uh, that showed they a hundred years ago, they went and did a really detailed um, survey and counted all the, all the different species of, of um, native bees and, and what plants they were, um, they were nectaring from and collecting pollen from. And then they went back a hundred years later and did the same thing. And what they found was that over 50% of uh, the species that were once in that, those, that area in that, this particular county in, in our neighboring Illinois are gone from the region, gone from the county, not, not completely extinct, but they're gone. And, um, and so, um, and, and just when those uh, species disappear, it's not just the, the pollinators, but it's, it can also be the plants that they pollinate. So, so it's a huge problem. And, and you know, there's lots of reasons behind this, uh, climate change, pesticides, pathogens, invasive species, but the number one problem really is habitat loss and fragmentation. You know, and that, that can lead to a whole um, host of, of problems. Uh, not only are you just decreasing the overall size of, of the habitat, so you know if you have less habitat in a smaller area, it's that's less area available for pollinators. Um, but it also can somewhat magnify a lot of these other issues. Uh, you they you have more edges, and so you they might be more prone to invasive species invasions. Um, they are less resilient for um, climate change and other other disturbances. Uh, and you know, even if you have patches of, of high quality habitat, if they're too isolated, they're, they're kind of like desolate islands. And um, the populations of one area, uh, they can't get to the other area. And that can lead to all kinds of problems with um, loss of genetic diversity. It doesn't allow for migration or colonization uh, to other areas, um, even, you know, moving nutrients, you know, spe when species move from habitat from one area to another area, they're moving biomass and, and food. So this can have lots of different effects uh, on, on the ecosystem. So when we're, you know, as part of this project, you know, that's why we, we can, we want to increase habitat, but we want to do it strategically. And so if you can connect or add, you know, smaller patches and to connect these higher quality, um, larger patches of habitat, you, you are helping improve all those things, you know, and, and, and when I say connectivity, what I'm referring to is kind of how the degree that um, organisms or, you know, pollinators can kind of move unimpeded, you know, across these habitats. And, um, and you need to have, have enough of these little corridors, enough of these patches so that um, you can, you know, meet the needs of the pollinators, you know, that allowing things like um, gene flow, um, nutrient flow, migration, and, you know, predator prey relationships to occur. And of course, climate resiliency. So um, kind of said a lot there. <laughs> I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll stop there. No, thank you, Desi. That was, that was really enlightening and informative. Um, and it, it just goes to show how, how incredible this partnership is because you're really addressing all factors at once by trying to re strategically reduce that fragmentation. Um, but a, a large part of that um, comes through the role of NIPSCO in the project. And you know, they have these very long um, corridors or right-of-ways, Steve, um, that could potentially connect these these high level areas and um, you know through the idea group I know you've been really active and um, an active partner in that process um, but I wanted to ask you to share a little bit about something that I believe is relatively recent um, in, like, in the past couple of years anyway um, with NIPSCO's commitment to biodiversity. Well, as always, it's always great hearing Desi talk because I always learn a lot whenever she speaks. So um, with the biodiversity stuff, you know, we do have a commitment. If you go, if you um, go on the Nice Source website, there's a sustainability page. In the sustainability page, there's a biodiversity commitment. Um, and then with that, we're, we're, we're basically committed, committing to being good environmental stewards, um, especially from an ecological standpoint. And then I'm right now starting actually last year with the Holbrook project that uh, Eric mentioned is we're starting to write these management plans. And so they're, they're gonna be setting conservation targets. If it's pollinator habitat, that's gonna be a focus. So um, the next one, you know, we did a lot of work on the Calumet Trail. That's gonna go in a formal plan this year as well. 
Um, and so again, with the support by, you know, GLRI, Park Service, David Boone, Shirley Hines, that we'll be able to put those together. And I'm going to be leaning on people like Desi and Eric, you know, as we write those plans. So we have the same targets and same objectives in those, in those areas. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Uh, and as sort of along those lines, um, coordinating these efforts, Katie, it takes a lot of work to coordinate the um, everything that partners are doing. Uh, and so can would you be able to share a little bit about, about how um, the GLRI project sort of grew out of that Indiana Dunes Ecosystem Alliance and, and sort of the, the, the depth of the partnerships and how, how well, you know, we're working together and coordinated. And I know a lot of um, your role in this is keeping things moving smoothly and keeping people connected and uh, making sure the project is successful. Yeah, um, there's a lot going on behind the scenes on this project. Um, I'm not sure if you could get a count from that video, but um, there are 12 different partners involved in this project. So it's it's a lot to keep tabs on. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're just trying to make sure that things are progressing and moving smoothly, but also serving as a resource for, you know, questions and invoices and amendments and all that fun stuff. Um, but luckily, I'm, I'm a big fan of spreadsheets, so um, I quite enjoy this work, <laughs> but, but being able to um, support our partners in conservation to take that um, administrative role and take that off of their plate, um, that's something that's really rewarding for me personally, because I know that that can be tedious and sometimes doesn't seem like the most exciting job, but I quite like it and I know that it's important. Um, so love this partnership so much. And I, I'm always trying to think of how we can include more partners in these type of projects, um, especially out of that idea group. Because those are the, you know, the key land managers in the, the Nina Dunes region. So yeah, it's it's been a, a wonderful experience. Um, it is a lot of work, but it's completely worth it. <laughs> It sounds like the strength of these partnerships are going nowhere and everybody has their um, individual organizational commitment to biodiversity. And so moving forward, um, I think there's probably a lot uh, more successes to be celebrated and um, hopefully a lot of pollinators protected. Um, Eric, I wanted to try to uh, wrap things up with a little bit more perspective about the role that community members can play. Um, you know, Shirley Hines, the parks, they do such a wonderful job inviting people into these, you know, high quality nature preserves and, um, you know, that sometimes I, I think people believe that that's their only way to interact with nature is to go and visit a, a preserve. Um, but what are some of the other roles that folks might be able to play uh, to support your efforts? Yeah, and this is kind of um, one of my favorite questions, I guess. Uh, I think that there's lots of things that people can do, and it, a lot of it depends on where you are in life and where you are uh, with your situation. So um, one of the more obvious things, if you haven't been following all this week, you can plant natives in your yard, right? You can plant a native garden, and you can use this great new Living in the Dunes pollinator guide to help, help um, you know, learn how to do that in an appropriate way. And you can also, of course, lean on all these great organizations with a lot of great information out there. Um, and, you know, some people might say, well, Eric, like I live in an apartment building or something like I don't have a big yard to do that in, but you can still do a lot of things for pollinators. So you can learn about them and be an advocate for them. You can be telling other people how important these relationships are and these natural areas are. You can get involved in an organization like Shirley Hines or Save the Dunes or even supporting um, you know, the National Park through volunteering. You can volunteer, um, you can donate, you can be a member of the board. Uh, a big thing that people have been doing uh, lately as this has become um, a lot more sort of mainstream that people are aware of these sorts of issues, um, getting involved in your town council and encouraging your cities and towns, um, your governments, your local businesses to go native and be planting native gardens, native rain gardens, things like that to encourage pollinators um, and, and not be planting invasive species. So 
a lot of ordinances are coming out where people are, you know, making new lists of what can and can't be planted. We've made a lot of mistakes in the past and we're trying to learn from that. Um, and then you mentioned at the beginning, uh, some of our work um, going into the agricultural realm. That's not something Shirley Hines had done in the past. And we have certainly um, converted agricultural land that's attached to our uh, nature preserves, but we're looking a lot more into working with farmers. They, uh, just like NIPSCO and Rights of Ways, um, own lots of land and they are stewards of the land. There's a lot of great people out there doing a lot of good things. Um, Porter County Soil and Water Conservation District was a, a partner on this and, and helping put pollinator habitat into private lands like that, um, making buffer strips, cover crops, all of these things can help a lot to uh, provide nectar sources and habitat through the winter and all of these kinds of things and, and just greater amount of connectivity. So um, don't think that all of those lands are, are barren lands or anything like there's there's farmers out there doing really great work to support pollinators and, and form huge acres of connectivity. Um, and then and then local businesses and new developments are becoming a little bit more progressive. But if you're going to a town council meeting and things are happening in your uh, in your neighborhood, you know, ask questions about things like that. Like, what do you plan to plant? Are you going to support pollinators? Um, we're very blessed and we take it for granted to have a great uh, power source company that's that cares about these things and is doing these things. NIPSCO has been a great partner for years um, and and really like doing it, right? Not, not just taking the opportunity to do it on a grant project like this with the partners, but going out there and putting their money where their mouth is and making these, I mean, those pictures are just amazing. And we're so blessed to um, have that, but there's there's lots of other companies that um, need to be reminded that, hey, like we we can do that, you can do this too, right? You can, you can make lots of acres happen. Um, so I encourage you to get involved. If, if you have the yard, plant the natives. It's super addictive and it's super rewarding. Um, and if you don't, there's lots of ways that you can advocate and support pollinator habitat. Wow, Eric, thank you. It sounds like there is a role for everybody to play. Um, how incredible. Thank you um, and, and hats off and applause I'm giving you for your incredible partnership, collaboration and what you're achieving together, what we're all achieving together. And thanks to Save the Dunes for Pollinator Week. Thanks for all these great presentations all week. It's It's been wonderful. Well, it's been our absolute pleasure. Um, thanks again to NIPSCO and the Nice Source Charitable Foundation who awarded us an environmental action grant so we could get the good word out about all of the work that we're doing on this guide and this collaborative partnership and you know, helping to you know, put those conservation tools in your hands. And that perspective that Eric just shared, I mean, there's a role for everybody. And you know, the more that we stay engaged with each other, the more that we, we learn um, and are connected, the more opportunities arise. So you just never know when the milkweed that you planted inspires your neighbor and then another neighbor and then another neighbor, and then you've connected to the park, right? So let's keep up the good work. Um, thank you everybody who has tuned in um, this evening and throughout the week for your support your encouragement and your love for our pollinators, um, please do sign up to receive a copy of our new guide. We really hope that people love this guide and find the concept of native um, pollinator gardens irresistible. We certainly do. Um, and so until next time, thanks again for tuning in and um, we hope to see you soon. Bye everyone.